Good afternoon. I'd like to call the July 18th meeting of the Board of Trustees for Johnson County Community College to order. Would you please stand and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome you to the meeting. Uh, Trustee Cross is present on phone. Uh, recognition, uh, roll call of visitors, uh, Ms. Schleist. This evening's visitors include Jamea Haynes, Chad Haynes, Dave Shacker, Val Ball, Dick Carter, Ann Watson, Lisa Reagan, Ron Tillman, Roberta Eveslage, Anna Taylor, and Colleen Cunningham. Thank you, welcome, and uh, we're pleased you could join our meeting this afternoon. Next item are awards and recognitions. Dr. Sapchik. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, I'd like to turn this over to Karen Martley, our Vice President of Continuing Education and Organizational Development. Karen? Um, well, I'd like to ask uh, Lisa Waldman if she'd please come forward. Lisa is our Director of the Kansas Small Business Development Center here at the college, and she will introduce our award recipients tonight. With a whole gaggle for you. <laughs> just right, right back here is perfect. Well, thank you for your time on the agenda tonight. We are delighted every year to share the successes of our small business owners and clients with the board. Um, typically, we introduce you to two of our award winners. However, this year we have invited four businesses to be recognized. Uh, we have some, some um, amazing, amazing business owners tonight. And I'll share those stories with you in a few minutes. Um, our, but just to understand, our Kansas, our Kansas Small Business Development Center award winners for this year uh, the first is Safely Delicious LLC. That is our 2019 Emerging Business of the Year within the Kansas SBDC State Network. Woolcott Foods LLC is our 2019 Existing Business of the Year. And this year, the Small Business Administration recognized and honored two of our clients as well. So those are our, our extra two that we're adding on. Meeker Creative LLC was our 2019 Kansas City District Office SBA Exporter of the Year. And Dean Adams LLC is the 2019 Kansas SBA Small Business of the Year. All four of these business owners, all four are behind me, um, are dedicated, passionate, and innovative. They are leaders and they are creating jobs in our county, our state, and providing much needed services and solutions. In the materials that you have, which uh, we provided earlier to you, they're on your table, you will see our event program for our Emerging and Existing Business of the Year Awards. That's the Kansas SBDC ceremony, which was held in, in the spring in Topeka. I've also included our 2018 JCCC Impact Fact Sheet. Um, this is a lot of data. We measure our clients' progress um, and all of their successes, and uh, I'm always happy to explain that. That typically happens in management committee or learning quality, but I wanted you all to have that and see our, our year in review. Um, our honorees tonight have been selected from a pool of over 500 SBDC clients at JCCC and approximately 3,000 throughout the state of Kansas. So between the data on the impact fact sheet and the success stories that you will hear tonight and that you can read in the program guide, hopefully you'll be able to glean a strong sense of their effort and the strength that they model every day in their businesses. You can also gain a deeper understanding of how our talented SBDC team um, and the college support these business owners. I've asked Stephanie Landis and Jack Harwell, who are the SBDC consultants that work with these four clients, to tell you a little bit more about them and their stories. So I will turn it over now to Jack. So first I'd like to talk about Lisa Reagan with Safely Delicious. Uh, and it's hard to find anybody more passionate than about her business than Lisa. Uh, she's channeled that passion into her emerging allergy-friendly snack food business making it her mission to make snacks that look and taste like other snacks. When you hear Lisa talk about her business, you walk away with the impression that she will be successful. She has already shown signs of this by getting her products placed in more than 100 retail locations in 10 states plus Bermuda, as well as eight online stores. Based on the number of companies contacting her about her products, Lisa is just getting started. 
She's built her own commercial kitchen to ensure absolutely no cross uh, contamination can occur and has developed packaging and marketing assets that rival any other snack food company, large or small. She's also given back to the SBDC by sharing her experience in our, uh, with students in our uh, business basics class that we hold every month, inspiring future business owners to pursue their passions. Please. I brought snacks, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to pass the bin around, and there's seven different flavors. You guys are welcome to help yourselves to a bag and treat yourselves. Um, I just want to say thank you to Jack. He has been a huge, huge mentor for me. I do not come from a business background, or a, I, I do have some food experience, but really this was not where I started, and this is where I am now. And I, oh, I, owe a, I just really owe most of my success, or all of my success, to the SBDC. I'm so thankful that this program exists, and it does help entrepreneurs just such as myself here in the state of Kansas. We have an amazing program. I've talked to people that are in other states, other businesses, and I get so excited about our program. And I'll tell them, they'll be like, oh, we don't have people like that helping us. I'm like, oh, well, I do. So, uh, so I'm really very thankful that, uh, and especially that the college uh, you know, has this program here for people like myself that are starting out, no matter where we are in our business, that we're able to take advantage of these resources that you know, the state funds and the, and the college helps support. So thank you guys so much for, for all that you do to support us and support the SVDC here. So thank you very much. Lisa, yes. um, a snack that looks like a snack. Yes. It's a great concept. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so it's gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free, soy-free, egg-free, and vegan. Yes. It's just air. It's just it's air. air. It's okay, all that air. It just looks and tastes. It's, it's actually free of the top 11 food allergens, so there's a few more that aren't on the bag that are also not in the product. But when you taste it, you have no idea that it's free of all those things. And my kids had all these food allergies, so I started making the classic like 14 years ago for them and turned it into a business a few years ago when I needed to find another way to support myself after I get divorced. So I thought maybe this is it, and turns out this is it. So, uh, That's great. So, well, thank yeah. you. So, yeah, great. thank you. That's wonderful. And the other person I want to talk about is Ron Tillman of Walcott Foods. Uh, Ron Tillman believes everyone should be able to eat homemade, fresh meals in their homes every day. Most of us take that for granted, but there are many among us that don't have the ability to prepare their own meals. Each week, Walcott Foods delivers fresh and fully prepared meals to customers that don't have, their own, don't have other options. While other companies meet the Medicaid mandated nutritional requirements with processed foods such as applesauce, Walcott Foods fills the need with fresh fruit and vegetables. When Ron first reached out for assistance from the Kansas SBDC, his business operated out of a small 600 square foot kitchen adjacent to his home on the farm. There was so little room to move around that because the kitchen equipment took up so much room that they were bumping into, bumping into each other as they worked. Armed with a solid business plan, he was able to secure a loan and move into a full-size kitchen with new equipment. This was only the first step in an expansion plan that includes enhanced menus, additional staff, and an eye towards moving into other markets. Ronnie, his son, has recently taken over many of the ownership duties from his dad and is continuing the growth that Ron initiated. Ron? So I'm a little bit older. I started <laughs> in business uh, after I got out of the military. I've been in one thing or another all my life. Everything I've been into up until the last, say, 10 years has always been small mom and pop kind of a business. And I'll be honest with you, getting into where I'm at now, if I'd known we were gonna be at this level, it would have scared the hell out of me. <laughs> I owe everything to Jack, I think. And it, like Jack said, we started out really small uh, and we've grown quite a little bit uh, and we've got a ton of ways to go. I always explain to my son, we can't slow down because there's more money to be made. 
if it's out there, I think you have to go for it. What you all do for us is unbelievable. I doubt that you understand how much it makes a difference. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie, and I'm also one of the advisors. And I am first going to speak about Anna Taylor. And um, so Anna is the founder of Dean Adams, um, and she was a stay-at-home mom when she was suddenly left with four young children and no place to live. Overnight, she became the sole provider and protector to her family, a responsibility that, a responsibility that Anna took very seriously. After obtaining her concealed carry permit, she couldn't find a safe holster for her firearms. And so she... Um, decided that she would take it upon herself, and through her ingenuity, she took a mouse pad and sewed it to a Spanx and created her own um, conceal and carry garment that was for women that allowed them to live the active lifestyle and not have to wear crazy clothes or sweatshirts all the time. So she took her last $200 and um, proved that the American dream of business ownership was possible and made a viral a video that went viral, and within a few months, she was over a million dollars in sales. Um, that, in and of itself, brought her to the SBC, because <laughs> she was like, whoa, what's happening here? So um, we kind of slowed things down, worked on financials, worked on process, worked on organization and structure, sales and marketing, which she's very good at. Um, and so she does continue to build her brand and um, awareness and is very big on education relative safety for whether it's conceal and carry or just personal protection. And so um, she continues to build that out. And her um, lines of holsters, if you think like yoga pants or um, leggings and stuff, that, those are the types of products that she's, ma um, that she's making. And they're good for law enforcement, military, and just any responsibly armed citizen or anybody who wants to protect themselves. So um, she's done a great job building this business. I'm already crying. <laughs> not crying. Okay. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here and not just be a number on your paper because I'm not a number and my children aren't. And I didn't get the college education that you offer here because I was an assault victim. And 15 years later, I found myself without my husband and responsible for more, my four children. I didn't have the education. And I was solely responsible for protecting myself and my family. I found out that the American Dream and Google can only get you so far. <laughs> and um, I was very fortunate when um, my first viral video took off and sales came pouring in. And um, I needed more than drive. I needed um, all of the, the resources and experience that the SBDC has brought to Dean Adams. Um, with the help of the SBDC, uh, I've not only been, we're not only keeping uh, five employees, but we have plans for 10 more over the next five years. Um, in addition to that, we offer a great product to the community uh, with all the safe, safe feature, all of the features that make a holster safe um, and concealable and um, education. And um, I'm just, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful to have the SBC behind me, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to provide for my family and be an inspiration to them and not uh, another person in the system. That's what I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so um, next we have Anne Meeker Watson. And she has been a longtime client of the SBDC. I think Melinda. Weren't you one of her first <laughs> advisors? So she has been building her business and had the idea of the products that she offers. Um, and she is the owner and creator of Sing Play Love. And her big passion that she has been working on um, is that she just wants all young children to love learning. And so 
While she was um, spending her most of her career working for two large school districts, um, she was both a music educator and a music therapist. And so she observed other educators having a, struggling to teach um, the skills with, that young children require to be successful in school and in life. So she was determined to develop a program to help them with the challenging behaviors of developmental delays in the areas of social, emotional, and self-regulatory self issues. So she developed a series of workshops and books and songs to teach caregivers and early educators how to utilize music-based instruction to joyfully engage these children in early learning and kindergarten readiness. Um, I started working with her um, as her business started to take off and we were working on sales and marketing a lot and trying to figure out how to gain um, more customers for her. And in that process, um, she started getting some an international exposure and that's why she's um, the exporter of the year because we put together, were able to put together a very successful program that went to India last year um, and, and they are now using her products and her songs to teach their children um, um, in these same areas and using the English language. So she basically see, sells them to schools and online, and she's also in talks with some large um, um, distributors and publishers to take them into their lines of products as well. So, Anne? I promised these folks that I would not require that you sing or dance. Um, <laughs> it would have made for a little bit more interesting broadcast, but I did bring party favors, so you can pass these around and take one with you. Um, I am in love with young children, and I feel a responsibility because there are so many kids that are experiencing challenges and not going to kindergarten ready. So that's my passion, and I have this magic trick in my pocket called music. And so I use music and equal parts joy and fun to help kids get ready. And I am so grateful to the Small Business Development Center for the opportunity to serve children across the United States in um, school districts that perhaps don't have all of the opportunities that some of the kids in Johnson County have. So I'm working in the urban core of Flint, Michigan, and Kansas City, Kansas, and Independence. And a number of districts around the country, and now I get to go Bollywood and be in <laughs> India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Royal Emirates. So we're going to be singing and learning important things like how to wait patiently and how to follow rules and how to be a good friend. And I think that we're going to make better citizens, and you'll ultimately have much better students here at Johnson County Community College. So I'm doing my part for you. <laughs> but again, so much love, so much admiration and respect for what the Small Business Development Center has done for all of us. You can see what a varied array of businesses we, we walked in the door with. And they take us all where we start. And I was a career educator. I was not a businesswoman. And they, they take us to this level with their magic ball and their, their bag of tricks to um, make us feel like we really can contribute in that arena. So um, thank you, and thank you to you fine people. Enjoy. So before you sit down, I just have to say on behalf of the board, congratulations. I'm reminded of the words of David Thoreau when he said, if one endeavors to lead the life which he or she has imagined and follows his or her dreams, he or she will meet with a success unexpected and common on. And each of you have, uh, with your passions and your dreams, have become something different than you thought before those dreams occurred. And I want to congratulate the staff at the SBDC, uh, Karen and the staff, and great work you do because I, more than one of you mentioned, I had the idea, I had the dream, but I needed a little extra. I needed a little encouragement, whether it was financial assistance, assistance or just support on a business plan. So uh, congratulations to all. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Well, again, thank you very much, folks, and we wish you the very, very best. Um, 
I think another example of the role the college plays in the community uh, in helping develop uh, businesses to uh, improve the community culture for all of its citizens. Uh, the next item is the open forum on the agenda. And uh, the open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, should be respectful and civil, and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion processes, uh, suggestion processes or are otherwise a subject of review by the college or board. Uh, we have one registered speaker for tonight. Uh, and so I would ask you, Val, to come to the podium, uh, state your name, city, and uh, address for the record, and uh, thanks for being here. Hi, my name is Val Ball, and I'm the only former graduate of Johnson County Community College in the race for the Board of Trustees. I am here at the board meeting to once again be the voice for the community of JCCC to request the board change the name of the Carlson Center, and we all know why. From now on, I will be referring to it as the former Cultural Education Center, but the question for today is how? How does it happen that a president of a college can resign in shame and yet keep his name on a building? How can the community change what we see as a problem? The student-run newspaper on campus has requested the change multiple times, and employees have voiced their opinions, or not for fear of retaliation, about the disgrace the name of the former Cultural Education Center brings to our community college. And how does that relate to what is going on right here, right now? We have a recent employee engagement survey that cost taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars that shows there is an alarming lack of trust in senior leadership here at the college. The recent Higher Learning Commission report flags shared governance as a real problem at JCCC. We have a president that is resigning slash retiring one month after renewing his contract with the board for some unknown reasons and we, the community that is supposed to be a part of that shared governance, want to know what will be the process for replacing the retiring president. Will the college simply promote from within an administration that, is, that has been poorly rated by the current employees? What will the community involvement be in replacing the current president? Will it be rushed before the community can really have a voice by electing three new trustees? to help lead the college forward, one current trustee will be replaced this fall and the board will be encompassing at least one new vision in leadership and Johnson County voters should have their voice be the loudest voice for the future of our community college. Thank you. Thank you, I would just, we normally don't respond, but I would say that uh, each of those issues uh, will be addressed uh, through proper committee work. Uh, it will not be rushed uh, we'll talk in this meeting a little bit later about uh, a, a preliminary uh, fundamental plan for that. Great. So uh, thank you for your comments, Val. There are no other uh, speakers, so at this time the open forum is closed. Uh, we have uh, shifted the agenda, as you can see. We've decided that um, for some time we've, we've put um, board reports and um, speakers at the at the end uh, of the meeting, uh, and, but we're shifting to have most of our business at the end of the meeting rather than at the beginning of the meeting. So at this time, uh, there's no student senate report tonight. Our college lobbyist report, uh, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Chair Cook. Um, as is the past practice, or recent practice rather, I will hit some highlights of the report that, uh, that you should have in front of you and then uh, answer any questions um, uh, if, there, if there are any. 
Uh, the end of the year budget, so you, the state just started its uh, fiscal year uh, with the month of July. The end of the year budget ended up about $200 million um, ahead of projections. And so that sets the stage for the conversation that the Legislative Budget Committee and the, the folks that develop the budget for next fiscal year will begin to have over the course of the fall months. Um, that's good news. I would, I would say that it's probably not sustainable beyond another year or so, just given some of the um, financial uh, implications that the state has that it's looking forward to. And so we'll, um, we'll see how that conversation goes. There is also, uh, will be continued pressure um, from uh, House and Senate leadership to review uh, and consider changes to the tax policy. Uh, as you will recall, they sent two different pieces of legislation to the governor for signature, uh, and both of those uh, pieces of legislation were vetoed. So that'll be part of that budget development revenue picture uh, that we'll be looking at uh, as we move into the, the next fiscal year. The legislative, Joint Legislative Budget Committee uh, this, this summer and fall will be looking at um, community college missions and funding models. Uh, that is something that I reported to you as the legislature was winding up. We were hearing uh, those issues being discussed, in particular by the uh, House Higher Education Budget Chair. Um, that is an interest of his and made a legislative uh, request for uh, an interim study. While that, that study wasn't granted on its own standing, it will be part of the review of the Legislative Budget Committee. And I've listed the uh, items that are, are uh, going to be at least looked at or addressed uh, uh, over the course of the fall and, and uh, summer months. And that's the, that's the system. It's the community college system and the technical college system. It really probably presents us with the opportunity to tell, tell our story. And that story is going to be very different uh, from, from some of the, the other stories that, that might be out there across the system. We will continue to maintain awareness of the um, Board of Tax Appeals uh, cases. Um, recently, uh, in June, uh, the uh, Walmart case was, was decided uh, for Johnson County. That case will be appealed uh, in the Court of Appeals, and so we're kind of at a starting point, if you will, um, uh, certainly not at a finishing point, and I, I can't really say where that will go because I'm, we, we don't know, but that, that issue could find its way all the way to the Supreme Court, but it's something that certainly we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to monitor and, and uh, observe. And then finally, um, Governor Kelly had the opportunity to appoint um, her first set of regents um, to the Board of Regents, and so three new regents uh, will, will be taking a, a, their position pending uh, Senate confirmation uh, in that process. Uh, but, but for us, uh, there will be a change out from uh, Daniel Thomas uh, from Leewood to Cheryl Harrison Lee, who was most recently the city manager uh, in, in the city of Gardner. And so that's just that bears noting that, that we continue to have a, a Johnson County presence on that on that board. Um, while they just coordinate our activities, uh, it's still something that, that we pay attention to and, and work with folks on the Board of Regents. So, Mr. Chairman, I would stop there. If there are any questions? Any I'd questions of uh, Mr. Carter? Well, uh, Trustee Musil. The only, I think, correction would be I, I believe the Board of Tax Appeals decision in the Walmart cases is appealable to the district court. Is it district? On a full-fledged new trial under legislation that passed a couple of years ago. So it doesn't go to the Court of Appeals. So it's that's at least another year or so off in that and uh, an ability to try the case in Johnson County District Court at, without regard to the Board of Tax Appeals decision. So whether that's good or bad, ultimately, I don't know. But that, I, I believe, is the process. Th thank you for that correction. It certainly moves from the administrative process to the Correct. legal process. Absolutely. Trustee Lawson. I just have two questions. Uh, the first one is in regards to the internet sales tax that you spoke about. I know for a lot of business owners, that is something that, especially the local small business owners, that they really struggle with that feel it's there's an unfair disadvantage because someone could go online and automatically get a 10% discount because they're not paying that sales tax. Um, so part of me is wondering, do you feel like this is going to have an impact for Johnson County because we have the border with Missouri here? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, internet sales tax always plays out uh, in particular on, on border um, areas to the state. The, um, there was a component in the overall tax policy uh, in both bills uh, that would um, require the, that the state collect internet sales tax. And there were, there were certain parameters set uh, out in that. Uh, piece of legislation, and then the state portion would offset 
um, food sales tax, and so there would be a reduction in, in food sales tax. That's how it was proposed in the two bills uh, that passed the legislature. Uh, and then the local portion would continue to flow to the local unit of government. Um, that was in both of the tax policy bills um, that, that the governor vetoed. Okay. The second question I had is, of course, regards to the dark store case. Honestly, I was really surprised by the outcome um, of that decision. And, of course, I worry about how this will impact uh, a lot of valuations in Johnson County, um, as well as the mill levy um, that we receive. When I looked at some of the... Um, so Larry Clark at the International Association of Assessing Offices in Kansas City, Missouri, did an interview um, saying that the dark store theory could be devastating to Johnson County, as many of our cities give a lot of economic incentives um, to move in here and, of course, would face damage later. Um, the potential damage for colleges is, is, of course, significant, and that is something that I know I've heard a lot uh, spoken out of the worry around that. Uh, I know in Texas there was actually a report done by their auditor for the state um, saying that these policies encourage businesses to leave their property empty to count on their assessed w assets while paying lower taxes and that it can depress overall property values. And they, they gave an example that the Texas <coughs> auditor said it could cost the state more than $2.6 billion. So obviously this is something that um, I have a, a lot, um, an eye on, of course, to find out. What are our legislative agendas in the State House around that? Yeah, right now there were no um, informational hearings this past session uh, on the issue. Uh, there are no bills um, that I'm aware of presently dealing with alternative property valuation. Uh, and so I think that was, that was part of the reason I wanted to make sure that I continue to keep that issue on, on your radar screen uh, because um, like Trustee Musel said, we're still probably another year out now, now that the legal process will start. And the other important thing to keep in mind is that was just one, that was just one set of properties. There is a backlog of a, of a number of, of several hundred properties mm -hmm. um, on the Board of Tax Appeals agenda. And so it is, it is concerning um, as, as those, can, uh, those cases continue to make their way through the process. That's it, Mr. Trustee Chair. Musel. I, I just want to clarify. By trying it at the district court level, you add another year to the entire process to get to the Supreme Court, not that we're a year out, because you have to try it at the district court, Correct. go to the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court could take it all the way up directly. But so it wasn't one year out, it's adding another year to the process. Um, I might also note that uh, I, I agree with Trustee Lawson that it's, it's troubling if that its decision were to stand, because what it would do would be to continue the transfer of tax burden from commercial businesses to residential, which has been happening in Johnson County over the last 20 years. And it's interesting to note that two thirds of our property taxes in Johnson County are paid by homeowners or apartment residents. So those who think that businesses pay most of them are wrong, and we've already had that shift because of the, the removal of machinery and equipment, personal property tax, and by other uh, tax policies from Topeka so that uh, apartment residents and homeowners bear the burden of property taxes uh, far more than businesses. Thank you. Back to Trustee Lawson's point on uh, appraisals, uh, maybe not directly related, but we're reading and seeing a lot about what's happening in Missouri with residential uh, valuations escalating. Has there been any, uh, and this is probably an unfair question, ha has there been any uh, discussion or concern about that that action transferring over to the Kansas side in the multi-county area is there any metro movement? Yeah, I, again, I think I think Trustee Musel sort of alluded to the fact that there's there can be a shift in the burden um, between uh, the business side to the residential side. Um, those conversations could be occurring. I've not heard any of any of those types of conversations as it relates to residential property uh, and those policies moving across the state that, you know, appraisal is set forth in state law. And so there would need to be a change in the way that the um, valuation process um, occurs because that's what those county appraisers use to determine those property valuations. So that's what we're watching for in the legislative process is any, any change potentially to the statute. Trustee Musil. Well, both Missouri and Kansas theoretically value your business and your home at fair market value, what a willing buyer would pay you if you were a willing seller. Kansas went through a 1989 reappraisal to, to do this catch-up 
where I, I remember you and Kaufman's house in Mission Hills was valued at 54,000 and they reappraised it at 2.2 million or something. And he said, yep, that's what it's worth. Missouri has been behind the curve forever. They, they simply aren't at fair market value. And so they tried to catch it all up in one year. Number one, you can't do that accurately, so somebody's gonna be overvalued. But number two, it's a huge, it's a huge impact on people in one year. So uh, I think certainly people in all areas of Johnson County, particularly the Northeast, have felt the burden of keeping up with fair market value the last several years because their values are going up six, 10% a year, um, which is a nice part of your asset, but hard if you can't afford to pay the property tax because it's not a liquid ac asset. So I think we're already there, Chairman Cook. I think we've done a good job of keeping up values. Jackson County, under Missouri's Constitution and statute, has simply fallen behind and tried to do it all in one year, and that, that is a very painful lesson. Trustee Lawson. Um, you mentioned residential um, homes, and part of me is curious, as we look over the years, what's happening with commercial owners as if this goes through, they landlock the community where they own parts of land that no more can be developed. So then I would be interested to find out how the Real Estate Association, if this starts to transfer over to vacant lots, there's a lot of investors that come in and buy up small homes and there's no incentive now to drop the price so they can sit and wait on a price until someone's forced to pay an inflated price. So that concept of locking the land from the community from being able to really develop in any other parts of our area is something that's concerning. Trustee Cross, are you there? Do you have a comment? Hearing no, none. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions of Mr. Carter? Thank you, Dick. Appreciate it very much. Faculty Association, Dr. Harvey. Hello. Um, what a surprise to be at the beginning of the meeting instead of at the end. It would have been nice to get a heads up, but luckily I was here in time. Um, so I want to start my report by sharing some specific things that some of our faculty have been doing this summer. And these are all interdisciplinary efforts uh, to engage within the community of scholars, enhancing our own knowledge with content that we can integrate into what and how we teach our classes here. And also opportunities that we can offer to our students. So first there's a group participating in a two-year NEH grant funded program called Indian Knowledge Western Education. And this grant is being run by uh, Sean Daly. It's an, he's an anthropology professor, and Allison Smith, who is one of our art, art history, actually our only full-time art history faculty member. Um, there are 14 faculty from departments across the college participating in this grant, and they traveled recently to New Mexico in June to learn about Pueblo peoples and cultures. Uh, the goal of this grant is to provide professional and curriculum development in the teaching of contemporary American Indian cultural studies. So basically, at the, end of the, at the end of this, the participating faculty should be able to incorporate some content related to contemporary American Indian culture into their classes. The program includes uh, bringing a series of speakers, giving presentations on various aspects of contemporary Indian life, and by the end, the participants will have visited reservations in New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Kansas. They'll also be participating in a series of local events, including the annual gathering at the Prairie Band Potawatomi Reservation and the powwow held here at the college each year. Again, Sean Daly and Allison Smith are the faculty members that organize this opportunity for their colleagues and uh, here at JCCC, and ultimately the beneficiaries of this, of course, are our students. Um, second, we have three faculty from environmental science, philosophy, and sociology that were selected to represent JCCC at a two-week summer East-West Center Infusing Institute. It's in Hawaii. <laughs> um, this is a competitively selected program that includes faculty teams throughout the United States, and they're studying Korea and exploring ways to infuse Korean studies into their interdis interdisciplinary curricula. They're also planning a regional faculty development workshop that'll be offered here in spring 2020. And then another one I wanted to highlight, there's so many things happening in the summer. I've just picked a few that were kind of, you know, groups of people and interdisciplinary, but uh, Seacrest is, and don't ask me what that stands for, but I'll tell you what it's about. Um, it's an NSF funded grant that's organized by Heather Seitz and Jean Ann Vickers. <laughs> They're two of our biology faculty. And it's open to all the STEM faculty to apply 
and we've had two co cohorts of faculty from JCCC and from other regional community colleges. So part of the group is from our institution and part are from some other institutions that are community colleges like us. Um, I'm participating in the first cohort and we're launching our second year with a one week workshop coming up soon. Um, the goal is to provide a community of support and resources for faculty in STEM fields at community colleges to conduct educational research. So we're doing research projects, educational research in our classroom, specifically with the diversity that comes with the community college and specifically in the context of, of STEM fields in those classrooms. The first cohort that I'm in worked on developing their educational research questions last summer, and then this summer we had a new first year co cohort that worked on that for a week, working on getting started with what, what is their questions that they're going to be exploring and collecting data on. And the second cohort is focusing this summer, the one that I'll be in, is focusing on analyzing and using the data we've been collecting and preparing it for presentations and publications. So, um, so that's a pretty exciting thing. And again, it's very interdisciplinary and also working within, among uh, various institutions. So those are just a few highlights of some of the activities our faculty have been doing this summer. A couple other things I want to discuss, of course. Um, the Faculty Association submitted a response to the HLC report draft that was shared towards the end of the spring semester. It was in the beginning of May. Um, we sent this to both the Office of Assessment and the Vice President of Academic Affairs. And it's our hope that our comments and concerns about the content of the report will lead to some specific revisions before the final report is submitted in September. Um, as I have mentioned numerous times in recent months, including um, last time, including people, specifically stakeholders in decision making, often doesn't actually cost us anything from a monetary standpoint. In fact, it can sometimes save resources. It utilizes the available people, resources that we have, and this can usually lead to better decision making and certainly to buy-in from those that are most impacted. So it's sort of been the thing that I keep harping on. Um, for example, last month I mentioned that faculty chairs were frustrated that they're being required to attend an additional 40 hours of mandatory training without additional compensation. But perhaps more importantly, they have since discovered that the content in this training is focused on general leader leadership skills training. So it's like a, a very general leadership skills sort of thing. And this training was chosen and purchased um, from an outside vendor and so far, um, the concerns I'm hearing now are specifically that many of our faculty chairs have already attended all sorts of generic leadership trainings throughout their careers. And as far as I'm aware, none of the chairs were involved in the design or the cho choices surrounding this actual training that's being required, like the content, for example, and that's coming up in a few weeks. So I'm not even aware that their direct supervisors were involved in any way in what is this training going to include. So the simple fact that we don't just want training, we want, not for training's sake, we want it to be uh, training that meets the needs of the faculty chairs in their specific roles. So if it doesn't help them do their job, then it's a waste of time and resources. So what I'm suggesting is that faculty chairs should have been represented in the decision making surrounding the choice and the design of the training from the beginning. Um, I am now compiling a list of requested topics from the chairs themselves, and I've been told that the facilitator is going to attempt to incorporate some of these items, but there won't be a lot of time available because of the other general leadership stuff that is going to be in this week. So I guess what I'm saying is, again, this goes along with the idea that involving people in decision making early on leads to a better outcome in the end. You get what you actually need. You're actually meeting the needs of people and there's more buy-in. Next, I would like to congratulate President Sopcich on his retirement announcement. I'm sure your family is thrilled that uh, things will be slowing down for you in a year. Uh, I, know, I also know we'll have plenty of opportunities this next year to celebrate your service to the college. There are two things that you mentioned in your announcement that I wanted to comment on specifically today. First, um, that there's a pause in the filling of the CFO position. And you mentioned that the position is crucial to the new president's agenda, and they should have the opportunity to identify the individual with whom they will work. And I don't think that's an unreasonable statement. 
Um, you also mention that in today's world of community college leadership, the standard length of time that someone serves as a president is something around three and a half years? Three to four. Okay, three to four years. So I have three comments on this. Okay, so first, we don't want a president that's gonna come in for just a few years and mess with things, <laughs> and mess up things, and then leave. Second, in the same way that it's important that the new president chooses the new CFO, I think it's also important in an election year to allow a timeline that gives the newly elected board, whatever that makeup might be, um, a chance to choose the next president that they'll be working with. And then third, it's important that all important shareholders have an opportunity to be part of these important decisions. That is why I just wanted to remind everyone before we get started that in the past college president searches, the faculty association was allowed to choose two representatives to serve on the search committee for the president of the college. And they served on behalf of faculty. So I just want to remind you that that has been the practice, the long tradition, and I know there was two faculty that served on the search committee that hired you. Finally, some might not know this, but I'm very involved in my church. I regularly lead music. I'm actually a trustee at my church. Um, Sunday, our pastor posed this question. He said, what kind of people will we be? And of course, there was a lot of discussion that followed that. But this question of what kind of people will we be, we heard tonight from a community member that was asking for the Carlson Center to be renamed. And this is something that I, I was not here at the time. I don't have a long history with this. but. I've heard from countless numbers of our faculty and staff that have requested for years and years that, this, that the Carlson Center be renamed. And we're in 2019, and our inaction communicates values to our students, to our employees, and to our community. So if we don't act on situations that are public, how can we be trusted to act on private instances of harassment, abuse, or discrimination? And I just wonder what we're teaching our students if we just don't do anything. So what kind of people will we be? Another one last thing on that. Um, in our last HLC site visit, it was noted, quote, that there are not specific initiatives to promote diversity of employees and faculty. This is an area that the college may want to focus on moving forward to mirror the diversity of the student body, end quote. That is from the summary that was posted of the feedback. Um, increasingly, institutions of higher ed are becoming more intentional and programmatic about their efforts to embrace principles of inclusion, equity, justice, and diversity. Universities and colleges frequently now, and I'm hearing this from colleagues across the country, they are requesting that job applicants address how they can contribute to a culture of inclusion and equity within the campus community in the form of a diversity statement. And this is a requirement with the job application. And how this diversity statement is used is extremely important. It's not just the act of asking them to provide a diversity statement with their application. At many institutions across the US, the Human Resources Department will have the initial screening of all the applications done by the search committee. The search committee will first only see the diversity statement. And then, after they have screened through those candidates, only the candidates that have an acceptable diversity statement are then looked at. The rest of their information is then shared with the search committee. So this is actually, uh, a lot of institutions are incorporating this, and I know this too because a lot of people I talk to, their colleagues and friends are saying, uh, can you read my teaching philosophy? Oh yeah, and can you read my diversity statement? Because I have to include this in my application. Um, and this doesn't mean this doesn't mean that there's like a, a litmus test per se or that you're looking for a certain kind of a faculty member experience. It could just be, it's just asking them about, um, it usually poses a question where it asks them how they're going to contribute to a culture of inclusion and equity and within the campus community. What kinds of things are they going to bring as an instructor? Um, and I would say this would be great for all important roles, staff roles, leadership roles, but this is a new practice. So this is a great institution, and we're supposed to be leading the way, but I think we need to decide what kind of people we're going to be, and I think we need to make sure we are intentional with our actions to go with that. So that concludes my report. 
Thank you, Dr. Harvey. I couldn't agree with you more about what kind of people are we going to be <clears throat> and what decisions do we make to get to that point. We'll address some of your concerns uh, in the uh, management report regarding the timeline and so on. I do have a question about the general leadership. What was the name of the company? I'm not sure. I don't have that information. Okay. Do you, does anyone know? I actually do, yeah. What is it? It's Chair Academy. If you'd like to look at it, you can look at um, chairacademy.com. It is the worldwide leader in educational chair training over the last 27 years. It was vetted um, by HR um, in looking at the appropriate types of training, um, considering the issues that we have had with chairs and what their issues have been. So they were considered. Um, and we will also uh, be looking at how do we adjust and add some much more um, direct things such as concur and some of the basic principles of our um, technology that we use on the campus. Um, but it is designed to talk about both what leadership is, what your leadership style is, how you work both as a faculty member who is working with other faculty members, how to act as a colleague as well as a pseudo supervisor, all of the things that are absolutely necessary to function as, in an appropriate way as the chair of a department are covered in this training. And had anyone asked, I would gladly have pointed that out. Well, I, I think that uh, the, what I'm hearing from folks, and again, I'm not a chair, so I'm not attending the training, but what I'm hearing from individuals is that in looking at what they've got so far, they feel like it's very generic. They're having, doing a strengths test again for like the 1500th time. Um, and that there are a lot more nuts and bolts and specific questions that they would like to see addressed. And they weren't, they weren't involved in the discussion of choosing this or what was gonna be involved in it. It was just, uh, and I, I'm not aware of the, their direct supervisors being involved either. So I'm not saying that you didn't choose the one that you felt was the best, and I don't even know anything about it. However, again, I go back to that part where involving people in the choice from the beginning, it not only does it improve the choice, but it also improves buy-in. Because if people are actually involved in it, if they have representatives representing them in that decision-making process, then they're not just taking your word for it. They're not just saying, okay, we're just oh, going to take the decision. It's not my word for it. Well, or I whoever didn't make it the was, choice. whoever it's it was that made word. the choice, as far as I can tell, it wasn't the faculty chairs and it wasn't uh, any of their direct supervisors. So that's why I'm saying involving them, maybe you end up with the same outcome, mm -hmm. maybe you don't, but it's an important part of uh, working with people and not having uh, your employees be so frustrated. It, I, again, that's just, I just feel like I keep saying the same thing. Just involve people from the beginning and let them be part of that decision where you find, oh yeah, that is the best option that we have available to us and then how can we um, customize it to meet the needs here at the institution. But again, they weren't involved in the decision. So Dr. <coughs> Dr. I Harvey. can only relay what I'm, what I'm hearing from my faculty. Thank you. Uh, I, I expect that that discussion will continue uh, between the Vice President of Academic Affairs and our, our chairs as this whole training process evolves and takes place. So I appreciate, I appreciate your comments. Thanks. Trustee Cross, we just had your twin brother on the phone. <laughs> and uh, he uh, is, is, is uh, traveling. So thank you for being here. Uh, you have our sympathy for your loss. I did not share with the board that you were attending a funeral of a family member, but you have our sympathy and thank you for being here. And as you can see on the agenda, you're next with the Johnson County Education Research Triangle. So thank you for your timeliness. Mr. Chair, thank you. I appreciate uh, the accommodation of allowing me to participate by phone. I, uh, my mother's oldest sister passed away in Wichita in a large Catholic family. I dropped my brother in Texas off at the airport and I was on the phone. I, I don't have a report. JSTRT hasn't met since we last uh, met. Uh, so nevertheless, I apologize for my tardiness and I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being here. We understand the circumstance. Thank you. Uh, Community, uh, Kansas Association of Community Colleges, Trustee Lawson. Thank you. So I have two reports within that one because this organization also has a national branch for the Association of Community College of Trustees. There was a conference call, so I'll go into that as well. Uh, so the Kansas Association of Community Colleges is a branch um, that the next meeting is actually set for September at uh, Neosho Community College. Uh, they did hire a new uh, executive director that I spoke about last time. 
And they did give a legislative update that I just want to read what had happened so you guys um, can hear what's going on. So the Legislative Coordinating Council, which is made up of the leadership of the House and the Senate, met on July 1st. The LCC gets, its, gets to decide how many committees meet over the interim for how long. They decided not to allow a standalone interim committee on community and technical colleges. However, they moved the topic into a Legislative Budget Committee for review. Uh, some of the priorities that are going to be looked at in this uh, committee that impact us, uh, they're going to review and discuss community and technical colleges in four points here, how the institutions are funded and how the funding is distributed. Second is the mission of the colleges, transfer of credits to state universities, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of colleges, and whether the colleges are meeting the needs of the Kansas residents. Uh, so that was a nice legislative update for that. Uh, before I get into the national um, organization, I just want to turn this over to Nancy, uh, Trustee Ingram. She's the secretary. Do you have anything to add? I do not. I do not. Thank you, though. You're welcome. So uh, I am a member of the National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for uh, the Association of Community College of Trustees. We had a conference call, and it was actually pretty timely talking about the diversity policies around hiring practices for um, presidents. And I just wanted to read some of the um, notes that were turned back to us, or the minutes. Um, with respect to a publication, the committee is going to be putting together a lot of data from all the different colleges uh, that will become a checklist uh, and be developed to assist boards in asserting their current status and readiness to pursue excuse me, a more deliberative process for deepening the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts throughout their institution. Um, several committee members talked about the importance of the CEO evaluation as a step or beginning point to the actualization board priorities around, um, they abbreviated DEI. Two important components for focus are the valuing of DEI in the recruitment and hiring process, following by the implementation of board priorities through the CEO. It was suggested that any template or practices used by ACCT search consultants might be a good source of how boards inject DEI values into their search process. In the last paragraph, uh, in addition to holding the CEOs accountable for advancing DEI priorities, CEOs are also hold their direct reports accountable for uh, DEI activities under their preview. In this regard, sample policies and practices that are going to be discussed in this committee uh, that's going to be happening in October, that I'll be there, that are achievable but also scalable within an institution and able to be measured with benchmarks by the boards, which will be helpful models. Uh, so I found that discussion very helpful and something that I think we can bring back to the college. Uh, I will also want to acknowledge that I have been accepted to speak at this national convention um, October 16th through the 19th that will be in San Francisco. Um, it's their leadership congress and the topic that I'll be on a panel about will be the perspectives on tuition policy. Okay, and that thank concludes you. my report. Any questions of Trustee Lawson? What does DEI mean, Trustee Lawson? I missed that in the oh, definition. It was just the, the abbreviation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. I missed that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Musil, Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Foundation Executive Committee met on June 25th, and the fiscal year 20 Foundation operating budget was approved. The operating budget comes exclusively from a portion of the earnings on Foundation funds. The Foundation's operating budget is not supported by and is not um, is separate from the college's general fund. So the Foundation generates its own operating budget. In addition to covering its operating expenses, uh, it supports 160,000 towards scholarships and program support at the college. Um, that $160,000 um, is nearly half of the proposed budget for the Foundation. So almost half of the budget of the Foundation's earnings will go to scholarships. And that supplements the additional $1.2 million that the foundation gives to student scholarships each year. Um, and I think we first re uh, exceeded a million dollars about three years ago. So again, if you want to raise some money for the college um, for scholarships, <coughs> there's no better way to help students than to do that. Uh, the foundation welcomed its new executive committee that started on July 1st. The executive committee is made up of 
President Suze Parker, Parker Communications Group, Vice President Marshawn Butler, Children's Mercy Hospital, Treasurer Jeff Alpert, uh, the Alpert Companies, uh, Secretary is Dr. Sopchik, is President of the College, Past President Mary Birch, Lathrop and Gage, JCCC Faculty Liaison Melanie Harvey, and Student Liaison is the Student Senate uh, Representative Ankit Prasai. Uh, the fiscal year 20 calendar has been finalized and all foundation members and trustees should have received uh, that schedule in the email earlier this month. That concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions of Trustee Musil? Uh, next item are the committee reports and recommendations. Management report, Trustee Ingram. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The management committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, July 3rd. The information related to the management meeting begins on page one and runs through page 14 of the board packet. The management committee received several presentations from staff. Tom Clayton, director of insurance and risk management, presented his semi-annual property and liability insurance program update. Rachel Lears, associate vice president, financial services, chief financial officer, gave an update on Johnson County's assessed valuation for a final determination on the college's ad valorem tax revenue. Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President for Business Services, presented the single source purchase report and the summary of awarded bids between $50,000 and $150,000. The summary can be found on page eight. Ms. Vogler also reported on the sale of surplus automotive equipment. Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President, Campus Services and Facility Planning, gave the monthly project or progress report on capital infrastructure projects, and this report is on page 11 of the packet. Next, he gave an update on the construction projects across campus and reviewed the report on the financial status of the facility's ma master plan. That report is in your packet on page 12. Tom Picano, the Vice President for Information Services and CIO, gave a recap of the reorganization of Information Services Branch. He then gave a brief update on the fiscal year 2019 technology fund. This report can be found on pages 13, 14 in the board packet. The management committee has three recommendations to present this evening. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services, presented the 2019-2020 Management Committee Working Agenda, found on pages two and three of your packet. And we do have a recommendation accompanying that information. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees approve the fiscal year 2019-2020 Management Committee Working Agenda, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. Uh, on page four, so within this document, it notes that uh, second paragraph includes a 0.15 mil levy reduction. Okay, just a minute. I think the motion has to do with the, the, uh, the calendar, the working calendar. The working agenda. We're voting on the calendar. Got it. Just the working agenda for the year. Right. You okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Lee or Paul second that all in, f we have a motion and a second. All, second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries. Uh, proceed, yeah. Trustee hey. Ingram. Rachel, yeah. Rachel Lear presented a recommendation related to the college's fiscal year 2019 2020 budget. The notice of public hearing is found on page six of the board packet and states that the board will hold its public hearing on the budget in August. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to authorize the publication of the Notice of Public Hearing Form for the 2019-2020 budget, subject to adjustment as actual expenditure fig figures are available. Furthermore, it is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to authorize the publication of the Notice of Vote for the 2019-2020 budget at a later date, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. So, okay, so back to page four. Um, on the second paragraph, it says, includes a 0.15 mil levy reduction, uh, which impacts the property tax values as below, like you pointed out here. But you also notice at the bottom that we are not going to finalize this until October of 2019. So are we still talking about a speculative, um, an estimated, uh, sorry, property tax valuation? The board will vote on the final budget in August after the public hearing. Mm -hmm. The county will get their finalized numbers to us in October. So there could be some slight variation in the final mill levy at that time. 
Additional questions? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. We will uh, ask for a hand vote. I think it was 3-2, but uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Passes 3-2. Are you four, not voting? Two. Four, two. I'm sorry? Are you not voting? Four, two. Four, two. One, two, uh, four. I'm sorry. Four, two. And four. I raised my hand, but I didn't count it. Okay. Next okay. item. Our final recommendation is based on a bid for the annual renewal for fine digital paper. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of contract JCCC-1423 with Verative Corporation for fine digital paper for an estimated amount of $106,352 for the renewal for August 1st, 2019 through July 31st, 2020, and for a total estimated expenditure of $319,056 for the remaining optional renewals through 2022, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. Is this paper company the same one that's out of Atlanta, Georgia? No, I'm sorry. I don't. Okay, because yeah, because the one that's cited in the human rights campaign has a very poor number uh, performance against LGBT employees as a rating scale of 20 out of 100. So for me, I'm concerned about why are if this is the company from Atlanta that's been cited, uh, why versus Midland coming from Lenexa. Uh, why do we choose an out-of-state vendor um, with a poor track record or civil rights? And then um, the other question I have is, do we have recommendations for the leadership development in the annual contract? I'm not seeing, was that a misprint? No, those are, that's on the list of, in a report for those that are between 50 and 150,000, so below the board's threshold. Okay, so we don't vote on that? Right. Not for the next year, no. Okay, so I have a concern about our low employee engagement survey and that living as leader <laughs> is one of the highest ones that we're paying. So it makes me wonder if we're paying for worse outcomes. Um, <clears throat> any other discussion? I, I don't know how we can verify the source of the company uh, tonight if we don't have that information, but. She's looking for it. Yes, Trustee Cross. Do we know one way or the other what the record of this company is? I, I don't have that information. I, of the paper company? I expect our... Yeah, I mean, does Trustee Lawson have evidence that this company is who we think it might be, or I don't know, frankly? Well, I think I'm hearing that uh, our procurement team isn't sure where the source off the top of their head, and Trustee Lawson has read about an Atlanta company that hasn't had a very good rating. I don't know if the two are the same. And this is a renewal. This was not a recent bid. This was right. this is a renewal of something from a year ago. I'm merely asking, with, with all due respect, do we know that this is the company with a poor track record, or are you asking if this is the company? I'm asking is it, if this is the company that's out of Atlanta, because it's two places. So the human rights campaign, they're... Um, Scoring chart shows them at 20. And then there's a article that came out from projectq.us backslash Atlanta, these 14 Atlanta companies. Um, and then it continues on for the URL. So that's why I'm curious. Janelle, is that possible? It's a, You're looking now, aren't you? Okay. All right. Why don't we... Uh, hold that vote until Janelle can verify just to um, try and resolve this question if we can. So do you have another part of your report? We'll put that motion in second on the table until we can resolve that. I do not. That is the last of the recommendations. And Janelle, as soon as you find out that, if you would just get our attention, that would be great. Mr. Chairman, can I, can I uh, ask the, the two no votes on publication of the budget, if I'm fair in assuming that there are reason for no votes, are the same reasons they voted against the May management budget? We're past this, with all due respect. Okay. 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 Well, I, I'd like to make a comment on that if I could, that the budget we're publishing 
provides a college with over $4 million of new money from property taxpayers, two-thirds of which are homeowners. The, um, so that, that's all of your report, correct? It is. That concludes my report, unless Trustee Snyder had another comment that he would like to share. I do not. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the... Um, I have questions about the infrastructure, because that, that was some things that you had pointed in the presentation for the management committee. Um, stuff. It was the inf network infrastructure, equipment, and services after looking over the board, the management committee packet. Um, so you had written a summary um, that I have a lot of concerns about. Um, it looks like from fiscal year 17 to 19, we spent less than 5,000 on the total wireless network equipment. Um, but then you also mentioned that there's an overwhelming expense. Um, the reason I ask is because I'm seeing an overwhelming expense between those 15 and 16. Um, part of my question is because on Ruckus, they warned a lot about the wireless devices. They mentioned Realtek, uh, you're probably familiar with that, or Marvel um, Avastar chipset is what they mentioned, which is a whole lot of devices, it sounds like, um, that they had to go through a lot of change in 2017. So my question is, if, even if we didn't have a lot of these devices, the wireless security hacking and disruption that were listed as one of the most dangerous um, items at the last Kansas Associated, uh, Kansas Association of the Community College of Trustees, um, if we did find out that our older Wi-Fi equip equipment was one that was flagged for security concerns um, due to the firmware, is 3,000 over three years, and then this year having a zero number for budget enough? She's just well, let me, let me follow up with that, Tom, if I can, because I, I think Trustee Lawson makes a, a point here of, on that particular line item. Uh, we invested 185000 in 15 on the wireless network, 74000 and then 1002 Were those earlier investments enough to get us where we need to be? I know that uh, in the audit committee we spent a lot of time on cybersecurity, and so your answer is yes. Is there more to that than just yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's helpful. So, yeah. so hardware in the networking and infrastructure world has changed a lot, as you probably know. And it's converging into common servers, server blades, networking architectures, and so on and so forth. And the hardware, hardware has converged the software aspects have grown much larger. So Cisco is a major, you know, a global company that, that, that we use for our infrastructure as most, if not all, major corporations in the world. And their software, uh, their, their hardware is converged more and more into software products. So the, the thing you see up there on the, on the ceiling or in the hallway called an access point is just a piece of hardware. What really matters is not just the hardware, but the software behind it. Mm -hmm. So that investment continues to grow. Uh, you don't see the hardware change, but you will see, uh, you, you can see in the background, you can see that software changing and being updated, including that firmware. So, so it's always being updated, and those updates made three years ago are still paying off for us. And the reason you see the shifting of those dollars between the infrastructure back in network to Wi-Fi and six other things is because that's, that's intentional. We move that money around uh, and with intention and strategic money around that. So that's, that's kind of well, I do see that you replaced the 30% of the wireless already, so that was... Yeah. And can I point out again, this is simply what we call the technology fund, so these are annual hardware investments that are made from allocated tuition dollars. We allocate $3 a year of tuition dollars for this hardware infrastructure. There's a lot more budget in information services that Tom oversees in terms of managing our assets and, and um, the staff and the services to maintain them. So I, I want to make sure that it's clear that you're seeing a portion of a larger information services budget in this page. And there's an asterisk that says there's the some of these funds are coming from other places. 
And where, what are those other funds? Uh, just our normal capital budgets. Mm -hmm. And I think for the benefit of the public viewing this, uh, to, to support, Tom, your, your position of moving some dollars around. Since f fiscal year 15, we've been spending on average about a million dollars a year uh, in 19,965,999. So about on average, we've, we've invested uh, proportionally about a million a year into the, that's from this budget. So Janelle, do you have an answer? I'm sorry? It, yes, it does appear to be the head, the headquarters is in Atlanta. Okay. But there's an office but there's there an office. in Lenexa. Yeah, in but Lenexa. there's an office in Lenexa? Yeah. That, is that, it the same company? I mean, there are several. It appears to be. Yeah. I, I was able to track back to the company headquarters. So we're back to the motion on the paper. And uh, the question was, was this a company that's been cited accordingly? Any other discussion? Go ahead. They're in Atlanta. I don't know if it's the same that you're talking about. I would guess that. Okay, so you're not sure it's the same company right. that, okay. Mr. Chair, if I may, yeah. who, who is the organization you speak of, Trustee Lawson? It's called Veritex or something. Vera, is it, what is the name Verativ. of that? No, it's. It's on page nine. Yeah, Verativ Corporation. Okay, Verativ is the company at issue, but w which company is it that, that you know has human rights problems out of Atlanta? This one. It is this one. That's the one. Well, when you look at the Human Rights Campaign Index, this but, but is But is that company cited by name? Is that yes. the company that's cited? Well, it's a whole chart, and then every company name, and that name is on this, and the rating is 20. May I see it? Just to, we'll see. Can you pull it up? I don't have a copy of. Where, where may I go? I, I have no idea. Sure. Um, it's the Human Rights Campaign um, Company Index. All right. Trustee Schneider. I don't know that we're going to be able to adjudicate this tonight necessarily. Um, people on the procurement side probably need to do some research. Is this something that, that needs to be done tonight or could be done next month? Or do we, is our contract expiring in the next 30 days? Well, this is, this is the annual renewal for copy paper that we use across the institution. So, yes, we, we continue to, to buy paper. Is, and, and the reason we're recommending this is it's a renewal. We've had this company before, and they've delivered good product. Is that correct? Yes. And the price is uh, in our favor, it appears as well. The <coughs> question is, do we want to do business with a company that's been cited to have a poor rating in uh, diversity and equity and inclusion? Trustee Musil, you look. Well, I, I'm not sure, and I don't, we probably couldn't discuss it in the public, but because it's a legal attorney-client issue, but... I'm not sure what grounds we have not to renew them since we renewed them last year. If before next year we want to investigate further and if we want to reevaluate our procurement policies to either say we're only going to buy from local folks or we're only going to buy from somebody with a specific rating from some private rating agency, that's a policy question that I don't think um, you can decide on one bid out of all the others, especially when it's a renewal. So I, I think we go forward and then we, if we want to look management committee to review procurement issues on that, um, those issues can be addressed. In the meantime, Trustee Lawson, does this organization have like a website? The, the, the evaluator. Human rights campaign? Yeah. yeah. So it's conceivably we could perhaps just investigate that and learn a little bit more about the organization itself that makes this, these kinds of assessments and why they do it. Um, I think human rights is very important uh, around the globe. And so it would be probably a worthwhile uh, endeavor to do so. So uh, to move this ahead uh, with a vote, uh, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussions? Mr. Chair. Trustee across. Yes, thank you. Um, is there any way we could review this in the management committee, say, next month? Well, the, the contract expires July 31st, so I think that puts a, a, I understand. Puts a halt in a Perhaps pass this operational this evening, procedure and then discuss and review upon the next committee hearing. It's, it, this is a good opportunity to re, perhaps reassess this component. I concur, of and I think everyone at the table does, that human rights are important. Right. I don't hear any objections, so I'm just suggesting that perhaps we review at the next hearing this issue. I'm not speaking in opposition. I'm merely suggesting. Well, I think we're all for human rights, so I, I'm not. 
I've had some differences with you, but I've never heard you say anything bad about human rights. So. I don't get any, sir. Um, Dr. Larson, what would you, uh, could we hold off on this decision, and could we get further information? And is it possible to do... Uh, I guess I thought you were suggesting that we, that the management committee look at procurement policy as it relates to this as a criteria going forward, but that we take action on this particular recommendation tonight. I guess that's what I heard. Because you otherwise we won't have any paper. Right. right. So, but we could also reassess what we do for the future to make sure that... I'd like to do both, I guess, and take a vote on that. So I think the points are well made. So the motion is uh, and seconded to award the bid uh, with the understanding that we would further look under procurement into this company to see if that's a company we want to do business with. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. I, I want to make it clear that my vote is not about this particular company at this particular time because I simply don't know enough. My support is to review policies to see if there are uh, rating agencies out there that are um, that have the credibility and the uh, credibility to that see whether or not we would want to um, rely on them, not just for this company but for other companies. Exactly. So that's that's would, a procurement review that we need. To I do. would like procurement to review that with all companies that we do business with to see what their status is in these regards. While we're on management, and I know there's lots of questions and uh, comments have been made both in the open forum and with uh, Dr. Harvey's comments about the presidential search, and while we're on management committee, uh, I want to share with the board that I believe that should be a management committee function to uh, work with procurement to put out an RFP for a search firm for the presidential search. And I'm asking them to do that uh, post haste, uh, hopefully by next week, to get a, uh, an RFP put together uh, to put out for search firms. Uh, we then would uh, uh, act on, on that, uh, um, on, that, on that decision at the, our August meeting as a result of coming through management. And when we select a search firm, that will then help drive our schedule. But we intend to um, uh, find the best search firm we can as it relates to what this position will be. We will lurk, work with the search firm to identify a profile which will include a number of uh, community, staff, faculty, student input uh, in the next couple of months. And in August, we'll have a preliminary draft for you. I'm kind of hesitant to put that draft out until we hire a search firm to let, so we can work directly with the search firm. And uh, then hopefully we can make a decision in September uh, who that search firm will be as a board. And then those uh, sessions will be set up uh, for input to profile what kind of a president we think the college needs at this point in time. Uh, then uh, hopefully by November or December, somewhere in there, and again, that final draft that we have in August will be a little bit better, uh, but we'll, we'll send that profile out, begin to take applications for the position, and uh, it's my intention, and I think uh, this board's intention, that the board that will be seated in January, uh, post-January 1, 2020, will be involved in deciding the new, the new president. The, um, the information that we gather from all of the community input uh, in driving that profile uh, will be helpful to the steering committee, and we will establish a steering committee that will have, as requested by the Faculty Association for one, uh, two faculty members on that committee. Uh, we'll have uh, other representatives similar to what we've done in the past, uh, but that committee will, will deal uh, as, as closely to what we expect to find as we can in a new president. It is a new time and a new era, and uh, we, we, we likewise, Dr. Harvey, uh, would like to have a president that doesn't leave before three and a half years is up. Uh, a comment was made, there was no reason given to the president retiring uh, in the open forum, and I will respond, and the president can respond later, but this president has been here 27 years in three key positions, and uh, uh, retirement is something we all face, and he's simply retiring. I'll talk more about that at the end of the meeting, but uh, that, that I wanted to bring up in the management committee because I see the management committee 
being involved with all of our procurement contracts, and this is no different. Uh, President's recommendation for action, Treasurer's report, Mr. Musil. Mr. Chairman, the board's packet contains the Treasurer's report for the month ended May 31st, 2019. Uh, page one includes the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. May was the 11th month of the college's fiscal year. Next month we'll have the fiscal year end numbers, I assume, for June 30th. Probably should. Um, the unencumbered cash balance as of May 31 was $87.2 million, about $6.3 million lower than last year at the same time. All expenditures in the primary operating funds are within approved budgetary limits. And with that, I would move uh, the recommendation of the college administration that the trustees approve the treasurer's report for the month ended May 31, 2019, subject to audit. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. Page 17 in the middle, it says bad debt expenses. 500,000, it's oddly a round number. Is there anybody that can better articulate what this is? Um, and that is an estimate that we um, budget each year for potential bad debt from, uh, generally from student uh, tuition debt. I'm sorry, just student? Student tuition debt. Generally, not, not. generally from student tuition. Rachel, what does that run more or less during the course of a, a year, the bad debt? The amount for the full year. And that's an estimate? That's an estimate. Yeah. What, the, what's the actual? It's probably slightly less than that. Slightly but less. Really? Mm -hmm. So I understand that that's kind of a reserve number to make sure we have funds in case, I mean, we're conservative and we're estimating high on bad debt. Right. And at the end of the year, it all washes out into the fiscal year and anything that's left that we've overestimated is carried forward into the next year's budget. Thank you. One other, one other point that I observed and uh, visited with, with Rachel about it, when you look at May 31, you'll see uh, we've only received about 61% of ad valorem tax. That's a key part of our, our revenue. Uh, but we have received the check in June uh, that will get us to that budget amount. And as Trustee Musil said, that will be year-end report uh, through June 30th. All in favor of the Treasury report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Dr. Sopcich, monthly report to the board. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cook. I'm going to open my presentation tonight by eating some air. There seems to be a lot of air uh, in, in the room. And I want to taste one. This is what you do after you get to announce your retirement. <laughs> You're outstanding. These are really good. Um, no wonder they're doing so well. Um, fantastic. Um, a couple things that I'm, I'm, I'm going to cover. Uh, first of all, every month I talk about this book or this, this collection of information across the college. I, I, I've got to tell you, it's really fantastic. If you don't have a chance to check it out, you should. I only looked at the first couple pages here and I was blown away by some of this uh, information. And Dr. Harvey mentioned it earlier some of the great work that the faculty is doing during the summer in ways they're trying to expand their, their um, I guess say their base of knowledge for the classroom. But this is from the Collaboration Center. Our student agency group continues to grow. It's receiving small to large scale project requests from small businesses in the areas of web design, search engine optimization, legal regulatory research, interior design, 3D printing, market and product research, and more. And these are opportunities for our students who work alongside faculty with local businesses in the community. What a great opportunity for our students. The steering committee um, that's involved in every client project includes Jack Harwell, James Hopper, Sean Smith, Vince Miller. I mean, this is fantastic. A little plug here for professional development days. Uh, there will be a session about the student agency, and we'll be looking forward to that. The Math Resource Center. Math Resource Center is kind of fascinating. We all know it's, it's extremely, um, it does great work. This past spring, they've had 18,884 students visit the Math Resource Center. The average visit was 80 minutes. The average student visited 9.7 times a semester. And the average student was in the Math Resource Center for 12.9 hours overall for the whole semester. That gives you some idea of the effectiveness of the Math Resource Center in helping students come a bit closer uh, to achieving student success. 
And then from the Wiley Hospitality and Culinary Center. On June 7th and 8th, Chef, is it Frase? Frazee. Frazee conducted a two-day set of continuing education classes entitled Hand Pies, Fried Pies, and Pastries. And then one session was for kids, and the other one was for adults. They were sold out with a waiting list. And this is so encouraging to hear how continuing education is working with our faculty provide, to provide this opportunity for people in our community. On June 14th and 15th, J Chef Reed conducted a pair of continuing education pizza classes and with 12 students attending the youth pizza class on June 14th and 14 students attending the adult pizza class on June 15th. I mean, what a fantastic opportunity for everybody involved. And then Michelle Riley on the 17th and 18th taught a two-day Serve Safe continuing education course with a great turnout of students all searching or needing um, cert certification. And this is fantastic to see, to see this happening um, in our culinary program now. There's a lot of stuff out there about some of the things that happen on our campus. We're not going to do the conventional uh, lightning round tonight, but I am going to briefly ask folks to touch on different uh, topics. And the first one is going to be, um, and, and some of these will be covered in much more depth for the, at the trustee retreat on August 10th. But the first one, I've asked John, our Executive Director of Institutional Effectiveness, to uh, give us a brief overview, and I say brief overview, of enrollment at our college. Thank you, Dr. Sopcich. If you remember last month, Randy was part of the uh, lightning round, and uh, he referenced a, a report by the Student Clearinghouse that uh, the national trend for enrollment for community colleges across the nation was, uh, for, for the last three years, was 7.3% down. So that got my interest peaked. Excuse me, John, what's the Student Clearinghouse? What's the Clearinghouse? The, the student clearinghouse is where uh, colleges submit student records, individual student records to the National Student Clearinghouse, and they va verify enrollment, they verify loans, and uh, give reports back to us so that we can track um, where students transferred, if they transferred to other colleges, if they're uh, dual enrolled with us as well as with another college. So it's a very massive data source that we have access to that we can get reports on our students. About, I believe, uh, about 97% of the colleges across the nation participate in the uh, National Student Clearinghouse right now. Um, so I actually charged the Institutional Research Office to go and, and do some more in-depth research about how do we compare with our enrollment trends compared to our peers around the region, locally, and uh, across the nation. And so they went back and they, they looked at the last five years. We went to the U.S. National Center for Education Statistics. Uh, any college that accepts federal financial aid has to report uh, by federal law. And so they went to the, the National Center for Education Statistics and pulled out the information that was reported to them and uh, generated a, a nice looking chart here for us to look at tonight. You notice that uh, Johns County Community College, I highlighted that for you, that's in the gold color there. Over the last five years, uh, we were down 8.7%. Putting that by itself makes it sound horrible, right? Makes it sound absolutely horrible. We're down in enrollment 8.7%. But let's start looking at some of the uh, comparisons. Let, let's look in our immediate metro region. If we look there, we see KCKCC, Kansas City, Kansas Community College, and we see Metropolitan Community College there on the right of us. Over the same, excuse me, over the same time period, they have dropped 22.1% and 16.6% respectively or outperforming both of those institutions. Then we went regionally. Let's look at all Kansas community colleges and let's look at all Missouri community colleges. It kind of gives us a regional perspective. Kansas community colleges down 11.8%, 8%. Similar to what we are, but, but we're still outperforming them. Missouri community colleges down 20.6%, well outperforming them. And then we went and looked at the national number over the same five-year period, and nationally it's 16.0% down across the nation for community colleges. So I, I think this uh, gave us a good perspective. I hadn't planned on sharing it tonight until I shared it with Dr. Sopcic, and he goes, John, I want you to share it tonight. So this is a little preview for the KPI that we're going to do at the board retreat. And uh, I think it shows that we're doing very well managing enrollment 
here at JCCC given the, the current trend. The second chart that we developed for you was the opportunity for us to look at a holistic approach to looking at enrollment. Uh, we've shared multiple times with everybody about uh, how enrollment for credit students at community colleges offers uh, pro-cyclical or in conjunction with the economy or the unemployment rate. So we see here that the unemployment rate is in the, the greenish color and uh, it goes on a downward trend over the last, over that five year period from 6.2% to 3.9%. Now this is an annual number, so you know, we, we hear monthly updates on that. So we pulled out the, the annual numbers on that. Then we uh, start looking at the credit enrollment and that's the very top lighter blue color up there. And we, we wanted to use an annual number for this. So this is looking at an unduplicated count for our fall, spring, and summer for those academic years that you see listed up there. So a student that would share, show up in both fall and spring would, not, would only show up one time in that. And uh, you see there that there is a downward trend, very similar to what we had experienced with our, with our uh, prior chart that you were looking at. Uh, over the last five years, there's a difference of about a little over 1,200 students uh, less. Then we reached out to Karen's area and pulled in uh, their enrollment for the continuing education area, our workforce development sector of the college. This is where the comprehensive community college comes into play. Uh, they showed us the trend for the same five-year period, and there's an increase of 1,400 students over that same time period they operate counter-cyclical to what unemployment does. So when students come for credit courses, they're coming when the, the employment's not as, not as well. And then when, once they get jobs, they go to our continued edu education sector and uh, Karen's area to get those better skills and, and uh, work, uh, workplace skills and things like that. So I, I, this is another example of what we're gonna be looking at at the uh, at the board retreat, and I just uh, wanted to give you guys an opportunity to see kind of a comprehensive look of how community colleges operate. John, what's the sources for those, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics? What well, that, that? That's the unemployment rate is, what, is where I pulled there. The rest of the data is institutional data here from the college. Trustee Cross. Could we receive a copy of this? It's <coughs> good data. Sure. Yeah. Trustee Musil and Trustee Lawson. Um, is this, this is headcount, not credit hours? Correct. Do we expect credit hours to approximate those same kind of trends? They behave very similar, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Trustee Lawson. You may address this later on. Uh, I know on page 23, um, you and Dr. Weber did a presentation. It's a or a published article titled Transforming Lives, Telling Our Story Through Graduate Salaries. Mm -hmm. um, that link didn't work for me, but then I also there was a presentation you guys did in the spring where uh, you guys talked about data that you've partnered with Equifax to track students' uh, income for the last five years after leaving the college, and then separating out the uh, data of the salaries by several qualifiers uh, based on completion, financial need, program of study, highest math level. Those were assessed in telling this story. So I don't have any questions for that. Um, but apparently it was highly praised. Uh, that was really nice to know that. Um, but I have not seen this research. And so I'm curious about you know presentations, videos that you have of this conference that you guys were at. Um, and then if they're a PowerPoint presentation, if at our next board meeting, you guys can explain to us the partnership of Equifax and the data that you guys had from our students. That's a great request, but they do charge. It's like $500 a presentation. <laughs> no, that's a great idea. That would be fantastic. Yeah, we come up with something on that. We, uh, and, and, and both the, the, the presentation at AACC and the article were the related data. Um, we, we, we probably figured the right context to provide it in, but basically it was looking at 
wage data further out for past enrollees to determine. And there's some really interesting and powerful stories in there that we're really going to try to use to inform prospective students and current students on the power of, of completion and, and, and the impact of not just entry level salaries, but what salaries look like five years out if you completed or if you didn't complete. But uh, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll work with Dr. Sopcich to... Well, to in the figure. summary of the publication that I found online, there was a link to your department, but when I click on that link, it doesn't go anywhere. So I think the link that's being published either needs to come back or I think that that's, that's embedded into the, the leak for innovations uh, stuff, and so there may be some password protection stuff, but we can find a way to get that. Sure. We'll get that. I'm not real good at, uh, at we went out and presented and we have this publication <laughs> so I don't usually share when well, we I do just, that but we can get that in the trustee <laughs> news digest that that article I mean I think if you could land a national panel for just two of you guys it seems like you guys have some data that's worthwhile listening to and Equifax I mean they they were one of the other big data breach companies a while ago so I'm curious about how that how you work with the data. Yep. There was a lot of information on that. We worked with legal to make sure that the contract was something we were comfortable with and, and protected. There's a different arm of Equifax that, that we're working with on this, but yeah, we, can, we can provide a lot of information you, on that. Go ahead. John, a quick question on the credit headcount, um, annual headcount. That's summer, spring, fall, an entire year's worth. The entire year, unduplicated, correct. Okay. Because so often we use census data yes. just from the fall. Correct, correct. yes. The, so oftentimes we, we look at this in a, as just a fall enrollment. Um, they're very similar in, in the trends in which they, they uh, mirror each other very closely. But and, yeah. and that census data doesn't reflect any classes that are held after that census. Correct, yes. Yeah. So census is considered the 20th day of the term, and then we, we kind of freeze that data at that point in time, and that's how, where we do all of our official counts that get reported out. But we continue uh, work, the academics and student services continue to work to add courses as, as students need those. And so enrollments continue well after that census. And so internally, we start looking at some end of term reports. But uh, for our official counts that we send to, to different entities and things like that, we have to use census. And who determines census? Census is actually identified by the federal government. It's part of the uh, National Center for Education Statistics and their IPEDS. I know you, how you love acronyms. Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. Um, so there is a very set standard of how you calculate that. And so we have to abide by those standards when we report. That's great. Thanks. So some good news and a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I'm interested in the continuing education and I would remind the board that in the college's new CTE building, uh, we have a space dedicated for continuing education within the Career and Tech Ed Center. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Karen, but um, with that good news of, hey, I've got a job, now I've got a company that wants additional training, give a 45-second commercial, if you will, of the significance of that space in the CTE building. It's, it's um I, mean, I can't sing enough praises about it. it. It brings them to the campus versus us using off-site facilities or partnering with another community college locally that may have space. And um, it, there's just really good synergies about us being there with those credit students and having those employers there. It, it, we're just getting, we're getting really good reviews from the people we've had. So when the Cross Electrical Company has a need for training his employees, he can arrange with you to bring them there for the weekend. They get the training they need, which is really what that graph indicates. Mm -hmm. And they then become a much better electrical company on Monday morning. And with the collaboration, I can't say enough about Dean Fort and the work that he's provided for our team. You know, there's, there's a lot of need then for credit within there too. So, you know, they're right down the hall. We work together. We put them in. It's about whatever is the best fit for that student not um, whether it's credit or continuing ed. So it's been a really nice collaboration. And you've already had some uh, interested uh, partners that want to go in there, so that's great. Okay, thanks, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to speak for uh, Trustee Cross uh, <clears throat> delivers a salvo, but continuing on, and um, by the way, enrollment, those are pretty good numbers, and the enrollment is a team sport. Everybody here, everybody, uh, is involved in that in every aspect of the campus because all it takes today is for one negative experience and uh, that student's going to go someplace else. So we're you know, congratulations to everybody. Um, 
the engagement study. Obviously, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, but I want to ask Karen to give it a brief, a very brief update, because I know we're going to dig into this a little bit more, too, at the retreat. But exactly where are we with that? Right. Well, we've started the listing sessions in June and um, have followed those in July. We have another listing session next week. And then we have two scheduled during professional development days in August. And as we get that information and suggestions, we're really trying to look at that so we can group some of those things together to, uh, be, because they've had great suggestions for us. And then we've also had some discussions with um, Dr. Barrett about how we could use the process that they use on the quality improvement side um, to look at some of those things to put those in place. But we, we really need to look at the whole thing comprehensively first. So that's the first phase. And then, of course, we talked about it in the HR committee. Good questions from um, uh, Trustee Musil and Trustee Ingram, uh, or uh, Lawson as well, sorry. And so I've been putting together some information, like we talked about the colleges, they're for the best practices, getting you some of that information, as well as being able to look at that data, slice it up a little bit more. So I've been working on that as well, too, to take that back and share that information as well, too. And we've had some questions about that in the listening sessions, too, on, um, on various uh, pieces. So I think that will be really beneficial to everybody as well, too. But I can't say enough about uh, the employees that have been in those listening sessions and how they have spoke up and talked and been very solution focused and also stepped up and offered to assist with things or volunteer or be a part of that discussion. So um, I, kudos to them. And we've had good attendance at those things. So we're digging into the numbers, getting behind the numbers, trying to get to the root of this so we can then create a plan and address the issue. Right, right. Yeah, well, specifically looking at a little bit more detail around um, the, um, the jobs. So if we look at the data and we, we look, say, at um, AMS or hourly or um, uh, faculty, so to break the data up a little bit, to take a look at that, um, also, just some demographics in general, and we talked about some of those in our session too, tenure, age, um, I, you know, those are those some of the primary ones that we talked about, and to be able to slice that up and get that information to all of you as well. I, I guess as chair, I, I want to share what my expectation is, because we've had a lot of discussion about this since the engagement <coughs> survey came out and since HLC. And uh, uh, Dr. Sopcic just made a comment uh, about enrollment that it's all of our responsibility. John, I appreciate the numbers, but I'm not necessarily pleased just because we're ahead of the competition. I think we need to look at what are issues that affect our enrollment and what can we do to increase the enrollment. But back to the engagement survey, my expectation is that each committee, we have management committee, uh, human uh, HR committee, and uh, collegial steering, that the progress we're making is on each of their, those committee agendas because this applies to all committees. Mm -hmm. And I would expect that when we get that data from the hearings, from the mm -hmm. open forums, the sessions, that the committees can come up with maybe three or four items we focus upon to improve this issue of communication and relationships. Mm -hmm. Because after all, we're all about effective teaching and learning that have a lot to do with effective relationships all the way uh, with all people involved. So that's my expectation, that that becomes an agenda item for each of the committees. And whether it's a progress report or there's action that, that com those committees can take, they then come back to the full board. So there shouldn't be, um, there shouldn't be the complaint that, well, this committee didn't know about that or that committee didn't know about that. And we have a commonness, because there's one thing we have to remember. We're all on the same team. And so what kind of people we want to be tomorrow depends upon how that team works together. So that's my expectation. Go ahead with your report. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hayes, uh, I'm going to throw one at you spontaneously here. Can you give us an update on the construction? We're all seeing the, the, the front of the Student um, Services Center and the athletic fields. Uh, when are those projected? I know we've been pushed back a little bit because of the rain. Yeah, well, the Student Center soundtrack will be completed in September this year. But as you know, we have had a lot of rain. So the athletic fields are about two and a half months behind schedule. Wow. So it'll be uh, middle of November before it's complete. Um, in terms of the Library Resource Center, it'll be complete in uh, February of 2020. 
and then the ATV building will be complete in March of 2020. And then as we look forward to the WLB building, it's November of 2020. That's great, thanks. Um, one of the things that we sometimes don't get to is the reason we're all here, and that's because of the students. Um, next Friday? Thursday. Next Thursday is going to be Anna Lin's last day. Some of you know Anna Lin. Anna Lin is an international student from Korea who does, who works at the front desk um, in, in our office and is an exemplary, an exemplary person in every, every possible way you can think of. Um, her performance at that job is unbelievable, and she's one of the kindest and most dedicated individuals that we've had the good fortune to meet. If you get a chance, um, please come by and say, please come down and say goodbye on Thursday. We're having an open Monday. house on open Monday. House. On Monday, huh? Um, on Monday. <laughs> I do love it. I look at my calendar in the morning, and that's what uh, I follow the day. Uh, we'll have an open house on Monday, and we'll celebrate uh, Anna's success because Anna's going to be attending American University in Washington, D.C. And she's going to be there because of the incredible support. I know Dennis Arjo is one of her teachers. Um, uh, Vin uh, is one of her teachers. It's really outstanding. And it's so exciting for all of us to see that right before our eyes. Um, that was going to end my report. But then, um, Val, uh, the, I, I, the way you phrased the unknown reason why I'm retiring as if it is some type of salacious reason that I am fleeing the college. I'm kind of a private person, but I'll, I'm going to respond to that and uh, will share with you the unknown reason why I'm retiring. Um, for those of you who haven't considered retirement, some of you one day will, it is a very big step in your life. Because really for the first time in your life, since kindergarten, you're going to be in a situation where nobody is telling you what to do every day. Maybe your spouse will, or maybe your kids, but no authority figure is going to tell me that I've got to be someplace. And so it's somewhat intimidating. I mean, it's actually downright scary. And so you bounce back and forth. Do you do it, or do you not do it, or these types of things go through your head. But it's really a team decision. My spouse and I have been talking about this for some time, right? My mother has been telling me for three years that I should retire. When are you going to retire? My kids are on me to retire. And the reason is that I've been going at it pretty hard for the past 20 years. And so at the end of the day, when everybody gets together, and you process stuff, you talk to various people in your same profession, your mentors, and you say, when do you know it's the right time? And they'll say, oh, you'll know. And guess what? I know it's the right time. My time here on this campus, as Trustee Cook mentioned, has been 27 years. <laughs> I've been one of the luckiest people on the planet, especially to, to walk in here and to be able to work at this institution that does such an incredible job changing people's lives every day. So I'm honored and thrilled to have worked here in all of my capacities, including the last six years as president, right? Here's the deal. In today's world, remember talking, Trustee Cross and I approached an ACCT recruiter at Headhunter, and I asked, what is, the, what is the normal time that people at presidents give when they announce their retirement? Because you have to be somewhat considerate of the organization as well. <laughs> you should be very considerate of the organization. The response was 12 months. That's the standard now. People give 12 months of notice. That will preempt the need for this, for this college to hire an interim president, which would be another interesting experience, along with a full-time president. So you put all that stuff together, and you think, you know, I'll be 65 in April. There's a lot of things that we can do that my wife and I can do, who spends an awful lot of time by herself. And so now is the time. So I guess you could say the unknown reason is love. It's love for family, and it's love for friends, and it's love for life. So you can take that, and you can put that on your Facebook, all right? But thank you very much for bringing it up. I wasn't going to go there, but I felt I had to respond. So thanks for the opportunity. And thanks to all of you for making this college what it is. 
incredibly successful place that does good work every day. So thank you. And that ends my report, Trustee Cook. Thank you. I, uh, uh, Trustee Lawson. Um, so at the national level, you sat on a panel with Dr. Donald Car Cameron, excuse me, to talk about the importance of executive coach. Yes. Um, and I wanted to know what was the knowledge that you gained from that that the national level wanted to learn from? Yeah. The, the one thing when you get a chance to, to work with someone who has so much experience and who has done such an incredible job of turning around an institution is it's, it's, it's kind of like making decisions. It's the day-to-day -day stuff. What, did I, what could I have done better? And believe me, those are the things that, that you go through. In this case, the priority here is to make sure that you leave the institution in good stead because it's about transitions, and transitions are so important. What this group may not understand is that every one of these board meetings will be watched thoroughly by every candidate for this job. They will evaluate and assess this institution based on the body of evidence that they will collect. And so the transition is critical. Those are just a few of the things that I've learned from this coaching. Um, I was very privileged to have that opportunity, and it's been extremely helpful in, in, in getting me to the point where I am. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. A couple of things. Uh, I think I heard you say that you've been with the college 27 years, and in your remarks, you said you really worked hard the last 20. Uh, does, does that that's mean the, that does what that's the, the kind of trustee support that I've enjoyed <laughs> yeah. the past six years? So thank you. My second comment is that uh, this thing about retirement, um, I decided to do that about three years ago, and just um, a few weeks ago, we decided to take our family. We have two two adult daughters and husbands and four grandchildren, and we went on a cruise to Alaska, and the grandchildren are ages. Um, eight to 18, and each one of them independently said, Grandpa, I wish we could have done this sooner. It was the best trip of our lives so far. So this issue of love, and we get so caught up in working the job, and early mornings to late nights, and we forget about the family. So whether you're retired or not, and I go back to Dr. Harvey's comment about what kind of a person, what kind of people are we gonna to be tomorrow, don't forget to take your family with you uh, uh, because uh, you never know when those, when those days won't be available to you any longer. My neighbor just lost a 44-year-old mother of four children, and now the grandfather is going, and his wife passed away in the 40s of the same, it was of breast cancer, and so now this 74-year-old grandfather is faced with the issue of raising his four grandchildren ages 20 to 11. So never take the days for granted that they'll always be there. Trustee Cross, you had a comment? Yes, sir. I, again, I was late. I apologize for that. But I did want to congratulate President Dr. Sopcich on his retirement. Um, I think it's fair to say few people have been more critical of you than me. And uh, at times that has been in the loyal opposition. And I think in any kind of objective analysis here, your six years has been um, somewhat unprecedented, I think, in this college's history, the political territory we were in, the, um, the situation in uh, both Washington and Topeka, the local politics that we had to deal with, um, the KPI and the def defining of what we do and what is a success here, what is not a success here. There were and there are a ter tremendous number of successes, and I do want to congratulate you on that. And, and thank you for your stewardship of the institution. And I appreciate that, Trustee Cross, especially coming from you. And I hope it to be seven years, not six. So. <laughs> well, I, I, I misspoke. I'm sorry. Uh, I do also want to say uh, I think it's imperative. I think Trustee Cook said this earlier, and I know I've said this in these meetings. We are all in this together. And I think any of us sitting at this table, each and every one of us or every one of us in the gallery and in the audience needs to understand that people do watch these meetings. I've been in meetings in Topeka, legislative cocktail hours here in, in Johnson County, and it is amazing who takes umbrage with what is said or not said here. And while some of us have been frustrated by the numbers coming out of uh, Topeka toward this institution, and 
Uh, we still need to be grateful for what they give, even if we are critical of what it is. Uh, and I, I caution all of us that lots of people watch these things, and if anybody wants to jump to do something else, that they should take that into consideration, that this is not House of Cards, this is not Game of Thrones, this is an institution where it is most readily accessible for our students and to provide them the best possible future. Uh, I had this in my campaign to, to they can learn and earn good jobs. So I think everyone here does their best. Um, you know, I, I, guess, I suppose on some levels, mostly in private, I will note <laughs> the, the tough words I had for you, Dr. Subject. I, I don't want it to, to go by that I didn't say you didn't do a good job and there weren't a lot of great things that happened here. I, I, I don't always have time to say all the good things you're doing. Our law school professors used to say there, there were a lot of good things, but uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on your retirement. Thank you. Well, we'll have several months to pay homage. I, um, I have found that whenever the CEO or the leader of our organization leaves, and I'll make some remarks now before we get to the consent agenda, is that Yes, there's the congratulations, and then there's always, and there's also the positioning of what's going to happen to me next, and what's going to happen to my department next, and is he in fact going to stay till June 30? Dr. Sopcich will be our president until June 30. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, our intention that the operation of the college is going to support those great programs we saw tonight. Uh, the four uh, companies that were recognized through SBDC. The lengthy uh, report that we get every month of the good news. And I tend to be a good news kind of person, not that we don't deal with negativity. It's important that we address the issues in the, uh, in the uh, HLC report. It's important we address the uh, survey results. It's important we deal with feelings of how shared governance we all have. But I would remind us that no matter if we're a trustee or a staff member or a faculty member or whatever our role is, August 19th we have a student body coming back to school. And it should be our collective intent to do the very best we can to honor those students with our very best performance. And uh, that's, that's my charge to all of us. Yes, we'll deal with the issues, but let's not forget about the great news of this of this college because it still continues to be one of the best colleges in the nation. And this guy has been around for 27 years uh, helping build that. So that, that's my, that's my, those are my remarks about our charge to all of us. Let's get on with our work, what our responsibilities are. We'll deal with the negativity that's there, but we have so much positivity that gets lost for the benefit of students. We're in the teaching and learning business and let's proceed accordingly. We have the consent agenda, uh, right. Trustee Musil. Well, I, I will save remarks about Dr. Sopcich because, as you know, we're going to have uh, 10 months or 11 months left. But there is an important transition listed in the president's report that everybody ought to know about. And if we don't address it, there are going to be some angry people. Our bake sale is moving from Fridays to Thursdays. That's a big deal. At 3 o'clock at the Culinary Center. And there are lots of people that line up every Friday. And I don't know how we're getting that out, Chris. But when I saw that, I, I noted it. Thursdays at 3, not Fridays at 3. So that, that may be the, the best legacy that we can have on the croissant side. How do you eat your donuts? OK. Uh, I don't believe we have any old business, no new business. We have the consent agenda. Unless somebody has an item they'd like to pull from the consent agenda, uh, we will. Uh, it's, it's an, the consent agenda for the benefit of the public is an item, is an area where we deal with a lot of routine items in a collective manner. Trustee Lawson. Uh, I'd like to pull the minutes and the cash disbursement report. I do just have a question about the human resource uh, section, and then I just a comment. Okay, so you want to pull A1, A2, uh, uh, all of B? No, I don't think I can, I don't, unless you say my question requires it to be pulled, I just have a question about it. Proceed. Am what's I your, pulling it or am I? I just what's your question? question? Oh, the question. Okay. So let me see here. When you look through all the salary ranges, um, I hope the public has a chance to see this. Most of them start on page 35 um, and 36. So 
when we, a lot of the questions I have are regarding under 1250 an hour. So when I was looking through Forbes, it noted that the poverty line, and then there was a way to narrow it down to specific areas um, and demographics, was 1250 an hour. And that was the poverty line for Johnson County area. But I see a lot of these employees that are listed at 1146, 1123. Um, yeah, so it's between 1123 and 1126. So my question is how many employees do we have who are earning below what economists are telling us is the true poverty line for Johnson County? Anybody want to tackle that? Dr. Larson, uh, Dr. Sopcich? That might be one of those. It's, it's a good. We did the hourly salary study this last year, and so they took a look at all of our hourly positions and made sure that they were within the range in the market for that, for whatever those are. So, so would you be able to get me the, the number of students that are under 1250? Well, I don't know if they're all students, but I can tell you the number of positions that are. Okay, whatever becomes in this HR addendum that is given to us, can I find out how many are? under 1250. Sure. Perhaps, um, Trustee Lawson, we could bring that to the next HR committee meeting. Would that be okay? That information. And we'll have one in August. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, not so much a question, but on, let's see, page 33, it talks about the settlement that we are going through with gateway developers. Uh, I just wanted to really be proud of the 15,000 that is going towards the foundation um, that's gonna benefit students. And that was just a comment that I have and then just wanna pull those two, the minutes and the cash. Thank you, Trustee Cross. Pull, uh, I think it's third grant for the Mexican Council. I'm sorry, you wanna pull A3? Grants and contracts? Yes, sir. I, I apologize. I don't know. Okay. We'll okay. pull. We'll pull a three grants, contracts, and awards. Uh, with that, uh, I'll have a motion to approve the rest of the I, consent. I think Trustee Lawson wanted to pull two other things as well, right? No, it was just. No, she. The she. Minutes. I think had a question and comment. It was just the question about the. I don't want to pull it because I know right. people need retirement and, and right. be hired, and I don't want to mess with that. I just had a but, question. But about you wanted that. to pull the minutes and the cash disbursement and address those separately, right? So I think there are three things you said, you, two things you wanted to pull and one thing Trustee Cross said he wanted to pull. Oh, then that would be three, right? Right. So you still want to pull A1, A2? Correct. Okay, and A3. Okay, so the consent agenda, we're pulling A1, A2, A3. I'll ask for a motion on the remaining portion of the consent Move. agenda. Second. Cross moves and uh, Musil seconds. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. A1. Okay. Minutes of previous meeting, Trustee Lawson. So my concern is over the course of this year, our board minutes have seemingly went from detailed bullet points um, to something that's very easy to follow uh, and then to something that is almost impossible to uh, follow unless you are here or watching the video. Um, so have we changed the policy on our minutes? Or is there a reason for the differences from last month to any other minutes? We've, we've synthesized those down. I mean, we've tried to make them a little bit uh, more succinct. Mm -hmm. it, the rest of the board, if, if the rest of the board doesn't feel they're adequate, then just let us know. There's a transcript out there that has verbatim. And there's a transcript that has verbatim out where? Is it on the web? On the web. On the web. So if people want to go to the web, they can get the full transcript and listen to <coughs> and, and read everything. Read Right. It's a full transcript of everything said. It just seemed that that was not our norm. And then this, from last month's meeting, significantly trimmed down, um, as well as these minutes are not published publicly, and the president's report is not as well. So how does the public get access to these minutes? They're published after they're approved. So they'll be published after tonight. Where? On the web. On the board, board packet? Web. Mm -hmm. Minutes. How are they listed in the, in the, um, on the web? 
minutes. Board minutes. Board minutes. For the month. So anybody can have access to the yes. to our website to get the minutes of the previous board meeting. Okay. So what am I expecting to see in the next month? Is it this condensed version mm -hmm. where it's just facts or is it points about what is actually in the reports. Yeah, our intent is to continue the condensed version, but the reference can go, people want to read every single word said, they can pull up the transcript, which is on online. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm referring to every single word. I think just the fact that there's a difference between the bullet points and then just stating someone reviewed items, I think that's a pretty what, a good what, May I ask what bullet points? Are you looking at May? April versus May? Uh, I'm looking at May. Versus June, then. Right. Each board report, so your report for the foundation was quite extensive. It had a lot of write out. And then now the minutes. Um, Trustee Musil delivered the foundation report, provides updates on upcoming events, initiatives, and highlights. So I think the intent is that if somebody wanted to know more about that, they could go to the full transcript and, hear, and see that whole detail rather than something in between. So I think that's what you're, the, the intent is to make it a little more efficient, quicker to go through the minutes, but at the same time, be able to go get the detail. I, I believe at the U.S. Supreme Court, many appellate courts, the only thing you can get is a transcript, right? I mean, there's no recording. It, there's just simply right. a type transcript that's later released. I, I'll just be, I don't have a problem with the minutes in this format. We, we have our full meeting is, li is streamed on, on the video and will go up later this week. We have a full transcript, word for word of what's said, and we have minutes the following month that tell you what, what was done in what order following the agenda, which has an agenda packet. So um, I suppose we could duplicate all that and have Ms. Schleicht uh, give a summary of each event on the agenda, which doesn't seem to me like it adds much except puts some staff member in the position of being accused of, of interpreting comments wrong or otherwise. So I, I, I don't know what the big deal is about this. I think we are, everything we do is in the open from these meetings. I would entertain a motion for A1, the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Second, I'll move. Uh, okay. We have a second. Any further discussion? Trustee Lawson. Any further discussion? No. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, item A2, cash disbursement report. Uh, Trustee Lawson. Okay. That is on page 28. The last line, it says um, June 1st to June 30th, the refund is ACH. I'm assuming that's the um, check clearing house uh, as a refund of 532,000. Is that normal? What were the previous years of refunds? And are these refunds to students, to loan providers, or a mix of both? Rachel, can you help? Mm -hmm. uh, those are refunds to students. Um, primarily in situations when they have um, a, a grant or loan is in excess of the amount of tuition that they owe, we refund um, the difference or the balance back to them. And yes, it's done, ACH is the automated clearinghouse, so those are done um, securely through a direct deposit back to their bank. Is this a higher or lower value than normal? So can I? I, 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 have, to, I have to go um, look at, at previous months or previous years, but that amount is, um, for the summer semester. So when students do their FAFSA and if they're awarded $2,200 for Pell, loans, whatever, and they owe the school $1,200, they would get uh, $1,000 to go toward their cost of living and other education support. And that refund would be through that method. Mm -hmm. Motion for A2. So move. It. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, A3, Trustee Cross. Yeah, I just, I didn't recognize what this was. It's a, apparently a grant from the Mexican consulate. Um, Linda. Uh, yes, uh, Trustee Cross, this is a uh, ongoing grant uh, by one of your, um, working with financial aid and foundation. I've worked with the Mex Mexican consulate. They 
um, award these grants for scholarships to students, not only to us, but I believe Donnelly College has received it as well as UMBC. So at this institution of higher learning, we do welcome people of Mexican descent. We work very closely with the Mexican consulate uh, downtown on Broadway, I think, is their offices. And so it's, a, it's great. They support scholarship um, initiatives at other schools throughout the community. And we're thrilled that they're a part of our network, too. And while maybe inclusion could be improved, th this is one of many examples that we have worked to make sure all are welcome on this campus. Right. Seems to me. I just wanted to ask. I didn't know what it was. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Can I ask how many how many years have we had this? Because I remember seeing it almost every year I've been on the board. I have to double check, but I know since I've been on the office. He's pointing out to you that I haven't always read it. No, I'm just I remember this and being 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 impressed that this has been a program that we've had because I didn't hadn't heard about it until I got on here. So I know at least three years, but I have to double check. Cross moves. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. We have no executive session tonight, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Aye.